Sueño, translated and adapted by Jose Rivera. Act one, scene one. King Basilio's castle, midday. The sun and the moon are about to achieve a total eclipse. Basilio and his advisor, Clotaldo, are in their 40s. Basilio looks over the sheets of parchment he's holding in his hands. This horoscope tells us you'll be born a monster. And what if the stars are wrong, your majesty? Wrong? The sun itself weeps blood. It fights for its life against a ferocious moon. See for yourself. It's the worst eclipse since the crucifixion. Buildings shake. Rocks fall from the clouds. Trees spontaneously burn. Night lasts 48 hours. Strange new constellation pollute the night sky with unreadable portents. Have you ever seen anything like it? Only in my dreams. <coughs> Every astrologer in the kingdom predicts my son will grow up to be a cruel, tyrannical, an outrageous prince. He'll cut the kingdom in two in a tragic civil war. And he will trample my cops on his way to the throne. But stars can only point the way to the future, side. They can create it. They can bend the wheel, but they can force. A servant enters, carrying a baby wrapped in a bloody blanket. King Basilio! Your son! The queen? Dead. Dead! The boy cut through a body, burst in a, the boy pressed through a body, cutting her off from the living world. She's killed by her son. He's baptized in her blood. This creature is already a man, Clotaldo. He's repaid goodness with cruelty. His first living act was murder. What do you say now? He has your eyes, son. God of love. How do I solve this? How do I rewrite this creature's destiny? How do I save Spain and myself? The baby cries. <gasps> is there any milk in the castle? A total eclipse plunges the stage into darkness. Scene two, 25 years later. A mountain, a tower. The tower door is opened. Rosaura, 25, robust, clever, loud, dressed as a man, tumbles onto the stage, landing hard on her back. At her side is an ornate sword. Ah, silent, mixed up horse! A naturally stupid mammal, instant challenge freak! I swear, if you were a bird, you wouldn't know how to fly. If you were a stream, you wouldn't know how to babble. You are a fart without smell, a religion without God, a dream of without sleep! Oh, I see all your lungs are still working, madam. Did you see that dumb beast throw me? Ran to the edge of the cliff and something scared it, like it hit an invisible wall and couldn't go on. It stopped and the momentum knocked me down the mountain so hard it practically left me blind. Good! Otherwise, we'd have to watch both our horses taking off. Get back here! Oh, damn it! It's as if they know something about this dismal place. Maybe they're not as stupid as we look, huh? Shut <laughs> up. Maps? Um, on the saddlebags. Galloping back to Poland. Oh, at uh, 50 miles an hour. Oh, brilliant! Lost! Lost in some ugly desert, some freak frontier. Look at it, Clarine. Illogical stone formations, creepy craters. The place looks like the backside of the moon. Food, drink, and shelter would be nice, huh? You're a dreamer. Is it Spain? It looks vaguely Spanish. Morbid and feisty all the same. Hey, Spain! Is this how you stamp the passport of every new immigrant to your country? In blood? <laughs> But since when have the lost and dishonored of the world ever found pity? Hopeless, stranded, wronged, overburdened, screwed, molested, tampered with, addicted to stress, fucked in the head! Sun's <laughs> going down, add cold to your list of miseries. Darkness! Ask yourself, what queer tricksters and fiends accompany the darkness of Castile? What contaminated mirage, I wonder, will come along to pick our pockets and flog our imaginations? I miss Poland. It's over, madam. We're doomed! No, <laughs> oh, fuck it! Let's have a little sex before we die! <laughs> Either I've started dreaming, or I've, succumbed, or I've succumbed to hypnosis, or I've been hit by an arrow from some English sorcerer. When the sun's last shy rays, I see 
I don't know what I see. I don't know either, but I see it too. A palace? Mm. Mm, too decrepit. Mm. A fortress? Mm. Too solitary. Mm. A home? Mm. Too unhappy. Prison. I know the smell. A prison. <laughs> Carved into the stubborn architecture of the mountain, camouflaged by walls of rock, so no one will ever notice it. A labyrinth, so well hidden the sun's perfect eyesight, has no, so that no one can ever see it. <gasps> Recommendation? A closer look. Let's give the owners a chance to wine and dine a pair of starving hobos. How do I look? Manly, madam. <clears throat> Sir. Approaching the tower. That door looks more like a wound than a door. Or it's the deep uterus out of which midnight's darkness itself was born. Or the cave from which nightmares enter the world of the sleeping. The sound of chains. Chains of a prisoner? A slave? Or a ghost? I am zero de me. Yeah, in Feliz. <laughs> a baby's cry. A poor unborn man crying from his cradle of stone. Mm. Uh, Madam, uh, Rosara, I'd like to leave this hoodoo place. I, I know this painful cry means nothing but tricks and suffering and really, really bad, bad torments. A weak light appears at the door. Rosara looks in. A brief, doubtful light shows me a dark habitat. And Karine! A ghost of a poor man, no? More reflection than ghost. A walking mirage, born dead, dressed in animal skins, and a slave maybe? Mm. Stolen from the oppressed island or a refugee of a defeated warrior state. Where nightmares and rulers and imaginary monsters walk the streets. Poor thing. His only companion is the exhausted light and the dead silence of the mountains. And us. Mm. Segis Mundo, 25. A wild man dressed in animal skins. Arms and legs bound with chains, holding a lantern, appears in the tower. God of love, God of light, are you listening? If you exist, tell me, what law have I broken today? What have I done to deserve this punishment? I'm told that birth itself is a sin. I was born once, I think. Therefore, I understand I'm being punished for my original sin. And since you're a just God, or so your books tell me, then I know I deserve the full heat of your punishment. But aren't all men born with original sin? Aren't all men guilty? And if we all are guilty of the strange crime of being born, shouldn't all men be enslaved as I am? Yet, I know from my small experience of the world that some men are actually free. Free! And yet, here I am! Why? What have I done to deserve this? Birds are free. Birds are beautiful. Is it their beauty that exempts them? I've never seen my face. Am I unfree because I'm unbeautiful? But wild snakes are ugly. And yet, they're free. It isn't mere ugliness then that imprisons me. It's something else. My ugliness goes deep. And it must be contagious. It's an ugliness of the soul. I must have something that will infect the body of the world. That's why I must be quarantined like this, like a secret medical experiment. God's wild new virus kept under strict control. I am the soul of polio and anthrax. And yet even now, in this degenerate state, why should I, a man made vaguely in God's image, why should I, who have more soul and better instincts and greater will and more life than a bird or a wild snake or a simple germ, why should I be less free? Those unhappy words break my heart. Who's out there? Who's listening to me? Rosaura? Say yes, and don't tell him about me. Rosaura steps <laughs> forward. Clarine hides. A poor traveler, forlorn and dishonored like yourself. I will tear your <laughs> eyes from my head for having seen too much of the world and too much of me. If you are indeed born a man and not a monster, all I know I have to do is to kneel before you and you'll give me mercy. <laughs> Your voice? Is that what they call melody? Your face? Is that what they mean by art? Oh, women and oceans, this beautiful. These are your eyes. There's light in them. Is it what the stars look like when they're seen by a free man? You 
confusing skin. This, this is human skin. Not the cold iron of the Inquisitor. Oh, blow. Ah! Is that like the wind? Is that a hurricane? Is that the rain? Say your name. I can't. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Your curses would sound to me like the opening notes of creation. In the beginning with the words, I can't. <laughs> Sadie's Mundo presses his thumbs into her throat. <laughs> this box is my crib and my grave. This sewer pipe is all I've ever known. I've been a bag of guts, a storm of chemical responses pretending to have a soul, eating and shitting and waiting to die. All this time I've spoken to one person, a dark man whose face I've never seen. Clotaldo gives me advice. He tells me how to hold my dick so I don't piss on myself. He tries to describe women to me and courtship and violin playing and government and honor. He tells me of a wonder, wonders of, a, of an Eden discovered beyond the ocean sea. I dream someday that I'll be exiled to that new world to live among my kind the noble savages at one with nature, on pure land, ten, size, ten times the size of Europe. Clotaldo hears all my thoughts. He's my silent diary, taking me in all my dreams, my confessions and worries. He teaches me how to read the Bible. He tells me, there, in between the lines, there's the flickering light, the shining residue of God's glory. God's actual fingerprints are there in the space between the Psalms, between the screaming heartbeats of the suffering Christ on the cross. Yes. And I have learned my language by listening to those delicious words. Glory, grace, resurrection, redemption. Gentle words that have soothed my wrists and ankles when I was a boy, like pure water on bloody wounds. Yes. But the years have passed so slowly and that black book has taught me a world I'll never see beyond this black box. One day, I grabbed the book from Cataldo and I tore its pages and put them in my mouth and I ate them. I ate them. Chapter and verse. I chewed those holy phony sentiments, swallowed them whole and shit them out again. I've been eating Bibles and shitting Gospels all my life. The words are written in my tissues now, in the blood vessels of my brain, in the hollow rooms of my mind, lining the walls with lies and promises. Sir, your voice has quieted those cunning words. Your skin is the only texture these depleted fingers have ever enjoyed. My thirsty eyes know it's poison to drink you in. They can't help themselves. They're dying to see that which will kill them to see. But I don't care. Let me look at you. More natural than all the nature I've seen fornicating from my narrow window. You, the gift of life. Let me die. My eyes and ears amaze me today. They show me and tell me about wonders I've never heard or seen before. Uh, I don't know what to say or what to ask first. All I know is this. Today heaven dropped me here and brought me comfort. If it's possible to be comforted by someone more desperate than yourself. My mother once told me of a story of an ancient scholar who was so poor he lived on a few blades of grass he could collect from the field. And one day he said, can any man be poorer and sadder than me? He turned around and he saw his answer. There he saw an older man, his mentor in fact, picking up the the scraps he had thrown away. I've been living in misery, cursing God, asking him, is there anyone else who suffers as much as I do? Now you've given me the answer. I know that my pain will be joy to you and you'd receive it gladly. So if I can give you any comfort, sir, let me do it by telling you my own desperate story. Ah, I sensed it. Someone has wronged you, sir. Someone has dishonored you. Yes, but the first thing to know about me is this. I am not... Guards! Oh. Careless, foolish guards! What's that? Great more confusion! That's Clotaldo, my mentor and tormentor. All intruders are to be arrested at once. My God, we're fucked! 
<laughs> Clotaldo and a tower guard enter. Clotaldo wears a mask. The guard carries a mask and firearms. What have you done? This place is prohibited to all by the order of the king. Arrest him. Oh, don't, don't, don't touch him. Don't touch him, Clotaldo. I swear to God, I'd rather tear up my own eyes than watch my friends suffer. Arrogant Sejis Mundo. Your miseries are so great that by God's orders you died before you were ever born. You died in the paralyzed womb of your nun mother. You are a ghost, Sejis Mundo. A flicker of reflected candlelight. And you must remain silent and invisible. Take him inside. Don't hurt him! <laughs> Throw me into your tempest pit, and I'll rise up against you! The guard drags Segismundo off stage. Florine is found by the guard, pushed on stage. Oh, 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 oh. Seeing how much arrogance offends you, sir, I'll be wrong not to humbly beg for my life. Please, be moved by my pity and... And for my, um, my, please be moved by pity for me and my companion. If neither humility nor pride moves him, well... It's been nice knowing you. <laughs> Take their weapons and cover their eyes. Oh, see, this sword once belonged to a nobleman. I yielded to no one, sir, but you. No one below your hand may touch it. My sword, on the other hand, can be manhandled by any Spanish son of a bitch you can find. You, for instance. Oh! <laughs> He's a poor old man! What kind of dishonorable nation insults an edges and harmless old clown? The sword, sir. If we're going to die, let us die with honor. I give you my sword as a testament of I give you my sword as a testament. It's a weapon of uncountable worth and must be respected. Even if my life is not. Rosaura hands Clotaldo the ornate sword. What's happening to me? That sword has a great secret and a great power. It's drawn me to Spain to avenge a wrong done to me. Who gave this to you? A woman I knew. What's her name? That's a secret. More secrets! And how do you know this sword has powers and secrets too? The, the woman who gave me the sword said to me, go to Spain and find some way through your natural genius to make the sword known to the nobility there. I know, once the sword is seen, that no one, that one of the noblemen will favor you and claim you as his heir. Which man? Full of superstitions and afraid he had died, shouldn't repeat his name. I am bound by my, oil, my loyalty to the king who said 25 years ago that if anyone is caught trespassing in this land, he should be killed, put to death, even if my own dear son was to break this law and die as a consequence to my action. My duty is to my king, a duty that beats louder than my heart. Sir, you look at me with so much sorrow. It's as if my heart sensing the presence of a kingdom spirit has run onto my eyes, forcing to see you, forcing me. Sir? I don't know which of us is the greater trouble, my friend. Find him. Blackout. Scene three. Basilio's palace. Duke Astolfo and Princess Estrella enter from opposite sides of the stage. Guards of Starlight! Aurora Borealis! Sarafle! Daughter of Apollo! Of Rainbows! My soul! My happiness, my love, my woe, my light. I could go on. <clears throat> your voice is a flute. Your heart's a timpani. Your blood vessels are little pipes. Your corpses little knots. To disembow, you will be to write a symphony in blood. One more time. The metaphor will do. Flowers are districts compared to you. Antelopes. Clam sea in edible venison compared to you. <laughs> Helen, slag box. Aphrodite, maggot poop. In short, <laughs> your princess are stronger than the mask oxen, wiser than the Joshua tree, more industrious than the ends of the Amazon. <sighs> Let me try that again. <laughs> <laughs> you are more poignant than the cross on which our, far, our Savior suffered and died. More poignant than the thorns which pricked his divine brain, more forceful than the nails unifying God and humanity in a crucifix of understanding, and more delicious than the ultimate reunion he enjoyed 
with his father. Thanks, thanks. I think I get it. But I haven't gotten a chance to praise each of your breasts. <laughs> <laughs> cool off, Duke. It's bullshit. Your words are flattering, but they contradict your actions. Everywhere I look, I see the machinery of war and the naked exercise of power politics. Pure destruction is your aim, Astolfo. Not love. It's conquest, not peace that you want. Hear me out, Signorita. Georgius III was king of Castile. Basilio was his son. Basilio had two sisters. One was your mother, dear cousin. One was mine. Both grand dames are dead, okay? He had Geth Barob. Basilio is old and feeble, is inexplicably remote. He spent his nights watching clock and dagger mysteries or gazing at indecipherable modern paintings. His mind is nearly short with illusions and hope governments <laughs> that could easily ruin the kingdom. His wife died 25 years ago in childbirth. That child is dead. Being more in love with astrology than sex, Basilio never remarried. His only heirs, unfortunately, are you and I. Your claim rests on the fact that your mother was the older of the two sisters and that you actually live in Spain. My claim, alas, the superior claim, rests on the accidental fact that you were born with a penis. <laughs> Perhaps in some future distant century, the postmodern 18th or 19th centuries, a penis will not matter. But this is today, my dear. You have to be realistic. Get to the point. Our declining Anglo king said he would judge which of us is the proper heir to the Spanish throne. That's why I have left my native home in Poland to come here today, but it's not to make war, as you think is to offer a compromise. I'm waiting for it. Do you believe in love at first sight? Do you believe that the gods of love are greater than the gods of war? Each of your breasts is a new world yesterday. A world more fecund, more laden with gold and glory than the endless new worlds discovered by your sailors. Let me finish. My compromise is this. Let's surrender totally to the gods of love. I will be crowned king. You will be my proud queen. We will see our claim to the throne in the damp, sticky bed of state and rule Castile. And the new world is one heart, one soul, one body. <sighs> Language has a strong effect on me. Your language is quite potent. I won the crown, Astolfo. And since I can't grow a penis to get the crown, perhaps I'll use yours instead. <laughs> so if wanting you will get me some power, I might be talked into it. Yes, I can feel myself beginning to want you. <laughs> Though I have to say, your eloquence on behalf of love is contradicted by the sexy girl's picture you wear on your pendant, animal. I can explain that. King Basilio, now mid-sixties and weak, enters. Mentally, he's in and out. Wiser than Jesus! Nicer than Socrates! Nicer than Jesus! Wiser than Socrates! We kissed your feet! We lick the end of your toes! I am moved by your sincerity, children. Come, niece, nephew, embrace the old body. Estrella, a little closer, please. A little tighter. Oh, just a bit more. Mm, you love me both. That's nice. You should love me. I'm a great king. And I have a great kingdom to give away. Mm. But first, there's something I must tell you both. It weighs upon me, oppresses me greatly. Silence is all I ask of you at this moment of truth. You know I'm called Basilio the Learned. I'm called Basilio the Great. I'm re referred to in the epic poetry of Castile as Basilio the Beautiful. I like that last part very much. Anyway, I like... I run an empire in decline. A new world 
was given to us by God and we have depopulated it completely, pulled the last golden turds from this exhausted asshole and <laughs> have nothing to show for it but syphilis, the reformation and the disdain of history. Still, we must go on. Anyway, you know I love mathematics. I am a numerologist and can, by studying numbers in various relationships, tell the future. Basilio, the man who can see the future through mathematics. I believe that's what they call me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I study the stars. You know, the stars have many names. Angels' tears, the perspiration of God, piercing rays of divine love, ancient pearls, light-infused originators of dreams, wishful fulfillers, tablets of mystery, dandruff of Zeus. <laughs> <sighs> the secrets of the universe written in nightly braille, the pressure points of heaven, sky fire. They have been the object of my obsessive study and contemplation because they are the secret pages upon God himself types our future, a very future, a gifted few. The geniuses of our time are able to read. Children, I am such a man. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 25 years ago, my wife died giving birth to a freak. I told the kingdom that its prince had died. It's a lie. I built a secret tower in the mountains, on the outskirts of the kingdom, among distant cliffs and sterile boulders, where sunlight never reaches. I published strict laws that no one, no, more, no one may enter that forbidden zone around those hills. In that tower, my unhappy son, this viper, destroyer of my dreams and hopes, lives to this day. He is your eyes, sire. Untrustworthy doctors and astrologers who witnessed the birth of Seismundo were killed on my orders. Clotaldo himself killed them. Further, Clotaldo has been the child's secret guardian, teaching this newborn tiger language, bringing him the word of God and the precepts of the one true Catholic Church. Throughout my reign, there have been rumors of a secret prince in fact, enemies have searched the countryside all over Castile. Rumors and rumblings keep me up at night and frighten me. I have three thoughts today. First, I love Spain. My Spain, very much. It was to spare Castile the rule of tyranny that I secluded my de deformed child. Second, I have denied the prince his freedom and this and his rights. And the denial does not agree with Christ's teaching, which says that in order to prevent tyranny, I need not to act like a tyrant myself. Third, it's possible I've made a serious mistake. What if all those prophecies, astrologers, all that number crunching, those eclipses and, and omens are wrong? It's possible he's inclined to, to tyranny and harsh violence, but it's, it's an inclination is this is resolved by civilization, by reason, kindness, and prayer. For we all know the stars only point to the future. They don't create it. The task can only be fulfilled by one, by a God who's ordered that man's will be free, free to choose good or evil, free to think free thoughts. Here's my thinking. It might, it might shock you. You think one of you will become Supreme leader of Spain. Hmm? Sorry. Tomorrow, I will place my son Seismundo on, on my throne. Without telling him he's my son, he'll be dragged out of prison and placed on the, on the most powerful throne the earth has ever known. <coughs> he will have absolute power to govern and command you. Three things might happen. First, he'll be kind, intelligent, and he will disprove the prophecies of the neurotic stars. If that's so, you'll enjoy his enlightened reign. Second, he'll be cruel, monstrous, and proud. He'll be the one-man holocaust the blood eclipse is predicted 25 years ago. <laughs> if that happens, I'll re-imprison him instantly. Third, if that happens, I'll abdicate the throne and make way for you too. 
Astolfo and Estrella, Radian king and queen of the Spanish state. Is that what you really want? It is my will. Do you question it? If that's your will, let cousin Sigismund appear. Let's meet this sudden and lucky new king. Go to your rooms. I'll take a while to release my son from his chains, dress him and make him ready. Tomorrow! Tomorrow you visit with the king. Long life and sanity to the king. Long live the great king, Basilio. Otaldo, Rosaura, and Clarine enter. A moment, dear sovereign. <laughs> A moment for you, old friend. A lifetime. Speak. Countless times I have come to you full of joy. And today of all my days could have been my happiest. <laughs> Why is it we old men are always on the verge of crying? That handsome boy has entered the Forbidden Tower and he has seen Sejismundo. I know that means certain death. But he showed me an ancient sword that I had given my dear Violante before I broke her heart and left her. I have an overwhelming feeling this boy is mine. <laughs> you are a lucky man, Clotaldo. If this crime had occurred 24 hours ago, it would have meant the death of your friends. But today, the secret of my unfortunate boy has been revealed. It doesn't matter who knows it now. See me later. There's much I must tell you. There's, there's much... We must do, you must do for me. You'll be my right hand man, the most amazing act of government the world has ever noticed and seen. These friends of yours that you bring before me, pardoned unconditionally. May they praise your merciful name for a thousand years. Friends, you are free. Oh, oh, I kissed these feet a thousand times and I mean it sincerely. Clarine? I'm still deciding. Get down here and start kissing! <laughs> Sir, you have given me a new life. Please give your slave her first command. No, I haven't given you a life. Any young man of Britain once he has been offended as you have, have stopped living. I have not given you a life. You, you must regain your honor, which can be done. And honor can be claimed spotless, but it's something only you can do. Yes. What I must do to resurrect my fortunes is to find swift, final, and if necessary, deadly revenge. Once my honor is cleaned in the blood of my enemy, my life will return to its former glory. Take your sword. A sword that was once mine. I mean mine while I had it in my hands today. Knows how to avenge a wrong. The enemy of yours. Is he a great man? He's so great, in fact. I can't repeat his name. But if you if you say his name, you inspire me to fight with you. As I don't want you to think I undervalue your courageous offer to fight with me, I'll tell you. The man who wronged me, correction, ruined me, is no less than the great Astolfo, Duke of Warsaw. Astolfo. May that faithless hog be butchered and roasted a thousand times a day. I mean that literally. But my young lord, if you are Polish, then the good Duke of Warsaw is your lord. And a lord can never offend a fellow nobleman. Even though he's my peer, he has disgraced me. But he wouldn't dare slap a nobleman's face. His offense to me, sir, was far greater than a slap to the face. If you understand me. I do not. <laughs> See, I'll tell you a secret. I don't know what force of gravity draws me to you or why I feel an instant organic sympathy when I look into your eyes. A sadness strangely mitigated by profound respect. This force forces me to speak. Look in my eyes, sir. Run your hand along the soft curves of my face. Listen to the strange pitch of my voice. Though I possess the swords and daggers of a man, I lack his ultimate weapon. Get it? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see those. See, ask yourself, isn't it ultimate insult for Astolfo to come to Spain to marry Astrea, though he's had relations with me? He's dirtied me, sir. 
He disqualified me from the clean, legitimate bed of every nobleman in Europe. I've said too much. Lights out. Scene four. Hours later. The tower. Segismundo stares out a small window, crying. Botaldo, wearing his mask, enters with food, drink, and books. I won't leave until I see you eat and drink. Is there anything greater than freedom, Cotaldo? If there is something, is it honor? If I had my honor, would I be able to endure this? I can't answer that. What is honor? How do I know I have it? Honor is like a bird you see flying out there who disdains gravity and flies from the earth to the heavenly ether, like a quick fire, like lightning escaping the hollow clouds, like an ascending rocket. Oh. I understand it now. Honor is a metaphor. Drink. Lotaldo offers the drink. As Segismundo drinks, the drug affects him quickly. The lights begin to fade on him, the sleepier he gets. What is honor to a prisoner? There is greatness in me, Clotaldo. Armadas and armies in me. I am a prisoner, only by force. If I had my freedom, I'd bow to no man. About no man. About no man. It's going to be a dark night, my prince. And all I can see in this terrible darkness are eclipses of amnesia. It's like a calming, killing gust blanketing the sky. The guards unchain Sigismundo and take him away. Blackout. End of Act One. Act two, scene one. The next day, the palace, Clotaldo and Basilio enter. Segismundo is sleeping in your bed, sire. Lethargic, oblivious. When he awakens, the machinery of state is poised to honor and serve him as if you were your majesty. Will you now tell me your purpose in this? My experiment changed fate. It challenged the stars. Can I, a free man, made in God's image, hold on my own son's destiny and prove that the astral prophecies of the two decades ago were false? Today, Sayismundo will learn he's my son. He will learn his heir to the Spanish throne. He will learn the extent of his absolute and riveting power. And we'll see. He will show us his actions, what he has been dreaming of doing all these years. If he's a if he's an enlightened despot, he'll be allowed to remain. If he's a tyrant, then he'll be sent back to his chains and his solitude. Why did you command I drug him? Why bring him to the palace asleep? If he, fall, if he fails this test and must be forced back to that miserable life, knowing he's the real king, he'll surely lose it. But he fell asleep in his cell before coming here, and he will reawaken in cell if necessary. Thus. We will be able to tell him he only dreamed he was king. And he'll accept that, knowing as we all do that, all who live are dreamers. I don't know if you succeed in this side, but it's too late now. He has been unchained and he might be approaching. I must withdraw. Speak to him, gentle friend. Teach him as he have all his life. Be the golden thread that guides my son through his personal labyrinth. Do I have permission to tell him it was you who ordered him imprisoned at birth? If he knows everything, he will understand all the dangers involved in this experiment. And he will succeed. He will succeed. He will succeed. Where is your master, oh, mistress? Oh, oh, she's a she again. And she's dressing the part. Rosales decided since she's come out of the closet, that you now raid that closet for the finest girl's clothes in the kingdom. That's proper and good. And she's changed her name. And she's lied to everyone who listened. She's told everyone she's your niece. And that little white lie has sent her stock through the roof. She's now an honored lady in waiting to this new vile, eye-pleasing, come hither, Estrella. That's good. As her uncle, I can legitimately be responsible for her honor. And she will derive her honor strictly from me. Yeah. Uh, that too. One more thing. About that other thing. The revenge thing. 
She says she agrees with you, and she's going to bide her time and wait for the perfect moment for the two of you to gang up and kill you know who for doing you know what to you know who. Am I clear? On yes. This? Only waiting is the best thing she can do right now. Everybody in this court, damn court, is so agreeable. As for me, well, the world seems to have forgotten me. Faithful Clarine, who is tagged behind that stark, ungovernable girl for the less than a minimum wage for too long. But I tell you, sir, if I don't get something to eat, and soon, I'm going to sing like a frigging canary and expose the whole lot of you double dealers and flakes to every hat pro to listen to me. Be my slave and you eat every day. Not perfect. The slave part is not perfect. <laughs> Music plays. Segismundo enters, accompanied by the servant, carrying a full-length mirror. Segismundo is wearing the formal clothing of a prince. Hideous. What am I seeing? Hideous. What do I feel? What is this dreadful beauty? Why do I doubt it and believe it? God of love. Is this your son, Segismundo? Is this me wearing silk and golden studs and shoes? Is this me surrounded by lucid and spirited servants? Is this me among so many people trying, dying to dress me and address me as your lordship? They say dreams are wonders, wonders chant and deceive. But I know I'm awake. I know, I now know, somehow, I am now splendid, said Gismundo. God, I didn't know what it was like to walk without chains. <laughs> oh my God, if please, if this is a promise of your future, keep it. Don't take it away from me. I've been dreaming of, of this day all my life. And now, it's happened. Give me your hand and let me kiss it, Sai. I'm honored to be the first among the nobles of Castile to, to pledge you unconditional loyalty. Your voice. You're Clotilde, aren't you? How is it possible? How can the man who mistreated me in prison be here, pledging his allegiance to me? In the great confusion your new state's creating you, you experience a thousand natural doubts. But I wish to free you from that, if I may. You are, sir, the king's son, the prince, the principal heir to the Spanish throne. You were secluded at birth and hidden in a desert tower because astrologers looking into your future predicted a thousand tragedies if you were ever to wear the <laughs> crown. But trusting that your strength of character could vanquish the prophecies of the stars because a magnificent soul can conquer anything, you have been brought to the king's palace from the tower which you lunged. This was done while you slept. While, while your, your heart was resting and peaceful, your father will come to you. And from the king, Segismundo, you will learn the rest. Lawless traitor, hypocrite, subversive. What else do I need to know now that I know who I am? You, Clotaldo, you have betrayed your nation by concealing me. I, Dimitriste. You have degraded the royal family and rebelled against the law. You've been unnatural and cruel to me. Now, as king, as law, and as myself, I condemn you to die by these very hands. <laughs> Majesty, no! No one will hinder me today. I swear to God, if anyone gets between us... Clotaldo, you must go. I feel sorry for you, my son. You have a chance to prove yourself. But if you are barbaric and fierce, everything you see will disappear. Sir, I must say something. I'm pleading with you to shut your mouth. By keeping you in the tower, Clotaldo was only obeying the law of the king. If the law stinks, then it should not be obeyed. Clotaldo didn't question the law or his king. I predict a really hard time for anyone, anyone who contradicts me today. Listen to your prince, fool. <laughs> and who the hell are you? Oh, just an old clown with a big mouth. A fly, really. A dust particle. Well, you're the only thing in this dreamlike world that makes me one bit happy. Can you translate that sentiment into food? <laughs> May you achieve a kind of orgasmic happiness a thousand times a day, oh prince. Son of Spain, subdue of the Maya, term of the Tena, sovereign of the old world, the new world, and the next world. You have emerged from the hot belly of the thousands of those mountains, like Christ glowing his way up from hell. A human sunrise, a resurrected hope, a Spanish 
Orpheus. May God help you. <laughs> Aha! Obviously, you don't know who I am. That's the only excuse you have for not honoring me. With a little more passion and a lot more language. Here's a hint. I am a Stolfo, the Duke of Warsaw. Your cousin, are we equals? If I say, may God bless you, haven't I honored you enough? Watch yourself. Or next time, I'll greet you with, may God save me from this fucking idiot. <laughs> Majestic father of the Spanish civilization, you are most welcome to this throne, which gratefully receives the round warmth of your royal rump and breathless desires <laughs> union with you. Despite all the prophecies which ranked you somewhat lower than Caligula, we know you will be a potent, plentiful, and penetrating prince. <laughs> Segundo has never been the soldier's excellent. Oh, madam, uh, before you go, I, I, there's something I have to tell you. I have to tell you what I've learned. I know a secret. I know who you are. I know Clotaldo is- Battle sounds, trumpets, cannons, shots, screams. Sigismundo oh. is being attacked. Oh. Oh. He's surrounded. I can't be afraid, Clary. I must be at his side. Long live Astolfo! Long live Sigismundo! Long live Astolfo! Long live Sigismundo! Long live everybody! <laughs> oh, stop the fighting, you assholes. Oh, look at yourselves, all that waste. Shame on all of you! A bullet whizzes Ooh, over Corrine's oh. head and he hits the ground. I'd better shut up, shut up and get my ass to some safe hiding place away from all this unrestricted hooliganism and machismo, some place where death will never find me. Clarine crawls to the upstage rocks and hides behind them. Soldiers from both armies enter and fight. Soldiers exit. Basilio, Clotaldo, Astolfo, and Estrella enter. All are bloody. Has there ever been an unhappier king? A more disrespected father? Your army is in full retreat. Traitors are willing. Loyalists and patriots are the ones who, who win wars. We're the traitors now, Astolfo. We must escape to the new world before Sayismundo finds me. Shots are fired. Clarine falls from behind the rocks. He staggers down stage, mortally wounded. Oh, fucking great. <laughs> oh, this is bloody brilliant. Oh. Who is this bl Who is this clown? Oh, just some joker who thought he could run away from death and ran smack into it. <laughs> this is mortal. I have some advice. Next time you want to avoid dying in war, run smack into the middle of the battlefield. <laughs> Don't go hiding behind tons of protective granite, because I'll tell you, if God really wants your ass, he's going to get your ass. Clarine <laughs> dies. If God really wants your ass, he's gonna get your ass. <laughs> what strange eloquence. <laughs> the clown's right. The more you run, uh, run away from fate, the quicker it finds you. It's foolish to run from, de from the decrees of God and the stars. True, but a wise man must try. Stars may prove false, and God's will is often ambiguous and subject to interpretation. Let's run. Clotard is right. We should run, my lord. He will protect us as we go. No. If God's verdict is death, then death is what I'll face here in the heart of my country, in the midst of the terror I created. Basilio, Clotaldo, and Estrella exit. Rosaura enters. Rapist! Rosaura stabs Astolfo with the ornate sword. He falls, wounded. The sun and moon are in total eclipse. Rosaura throws the ornate sword away. She sees Clarine. Basilio and Clotaldo enter, chased by Segismundo's soldiers. They surround Basilio. If you're looking for me here, find me in the dirt, my son. Take my gray hairs and wipe your feet on them. Step on my back on your way to the throne. Take my dis disgraced crown and my broken reputation and my solid honor and destroy them all. Make a slave of your senile parent, and you'll finally fulfill the promise of the stars. Listen to me, all of you. 
Whatever God writes in the book of destiny is final. It can't be rewritten. It can only be misinterpreted. My father tried to save himself from the words of destiny, and in doing so, turned me into an animal. Though it was possible, had I had a normal childhood, and then had I been able to cherish my natural gifts and sharpen my intelligence, I would have grown up to be a fair and tolerant monarch. We'll never know. But, try, but trying to keep me from being wild, he made me wild. If someone told you this sword would kill you, would you deliberately put it to your throat? Injustice and revenge do not help you to overcome your fate. Only reason, tolerance, and tranquility of spirit will. Let all of you who are watching this conquest remember it as the illustration of the astrologer's prediction. A kingdom left bleeding, a royal family compromised, a good king reduced to slavery. All of it has come to pass. How am I, who am younger and spiritually weaker than this man, able to overcome the fate he could not? King Basilio, stand. Let me take your hand, dear father. Now that you're enlightened and know your errors, here I am. I kneel before you and surrender myself and my treasonous armies to your authority. Take your revenge on us as you see fit. Hero, my son, such incredible mercy and wisdom. You're my proper son, again. You have conquered this nation in legitimate battle and pardoned me in a noble act of compassion. You have truly earned the right to be called King of Spain. Long live the legitimate battle I fought today hasn't, hasn't been on the naked earth or underneath the judgmental sky, but in my tumultuous spirit, where a war between a bestial nature and a human one has been waging against since birth. I've won a great victory of myself today. Clotaldo will be fully pardoned for all the years of my incarceration. Astolfo and Estrella will be restored to their proper places in the royal family. They will wed immediately. Thank you, my lord. Clarin will be buried with full military honors. And the tower, sir? <laughs> Level it. Erase it. Consign it to memory and never build another one. Soldiers carry away Clarin. Estrella, Astolfo, Basilio, and Clotaldo exit. My king, what about me? I have two regrets. I'm sorry I ever raised a hand against you in lustful anger. I'm sorry I tried to crush your spirit. If you can, please forgive me. You were insane then. Seeing how much you've changed, how wise and gentle you are, I can forgive you. Dear woman, nearly sister and twin. Don't call me sister. The sister can't do this. <laughs> My second regret, dear Azar, is this. Now that I know I'm the king's son, I don't think I'm able to love you and wed you as I wish, because you're not of noble birth. Rosara is a noble woman, my prince. She, she is highly born as any in Europe. Rosara, I am the man who dishonored your mother. I hope one day she forgives me. I am your father. I think I've always known it, sir. What's wrong? What if, Rosara, what if, I'm afraid. What if I wake up too soon and all of this once again is a shadow shadow and I'm found alone, screaming, in a prison cell? <laughs> Don't say it. Don't question it. Just let it happen to you. If it's a dream, good. Perhaps I'll wake up myself. Perhaps all this is my dream with you in it. Either way, we can let our dreams teach us about the brevity of life and the fleeting nature of happiness. If life isn't a dream, and I don't think it is, even better, we make it what we want. We stay and build on the past, or we forgo royalty and go to the new world to start over. If la vida no es sueño, that means this is it, my prince, my love. This is the one, this is the only life there is. The eclipse ends. Bright sunlight, blackout, end of play.
<laughs> right, so thank you all for joining us here this evening for Sueño, for this reading of Sueño by Jose Rivera, directed by Puti. It's really a wonderful job. Thank you, actors and director, for all of that hard work. I know they're exhausted. <laughs> Um, we always like to have a little bit of a talk back after these readings and hear what the audience might have on their minds. And I'd like to turn the discussion over to a couple of the actors. Francis and Rumbi both said they love to talk to all of you about <laughs> your questions and comments. <laughs> we could maybe start with the whole question about um, is life a dream? Uh, <laughs> the last act of realty, I would like to thank you all for being a lousy audience. You make history. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, as uh, Juliet said, um, this is a question uh, that we're throwing to you guys. Um, do we really, the life that we're living right now, is it a dream? Um, is it reality? You know, um, is this all real? Are we all real? The things that we do, you know, our everyday thing. Do we pose it as ourselves or it's just fake or it's just a dream? What do you say? Anybody? If I start picking up people, <laughs> I know all your names. <laughs> yes. I think that to some extent it is a dream because every day we wake up and then we go, go to sleep. And the mistakes of yesterday are gone. We can't relive them. We can't even like a dream. You know, when you dream something, no matter how wild, you still wake up and you can't relive the dream unless you're lucky to have a repeat of a nightmare or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we should have a chance to, to fix mistakes that we've made. We have a chance to choose a different kind of life yeah. for ourselves. So. To some extent, it is a dream. Yeah, I saw another hand up somewhere. Oh, Gideon? Yes, Gideon. I don't know, maybe we're living in the Matrix. I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that possibly, yes, it's, it's, it's very possible to say that uh, life is a dream. You know? I'm not going to go all philosophical, but the thought is that when you're sleeping, right, you don't even know what's happening to you. What if when you're sleeping, that's actually the real life? <laughs> <laughs> so it's possible this is actually the dream. Oh, the dead would suck. <laughs> <laughs> we were discussing with Julie when we started this about vivid dreams. Sometimes we have dreams that we wake up and we think, did that really happen? Those vivid dreams are just like, ah, how did that happen? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I think it depends on how we look at it. Um, there's two, two parts to it. Mm -hmm. It, we might be actually someone else's dream. <laughs> you guys are talking about the first part of the dream, of you dreaming about that dream. Yeah. But maybe it's actually someone dreaming us the dream. <laughs> you know it is? So, like, there's a statement I was saying in the play that dreamers are the dreams of God. I don't know if you guys do remember. So maybe this is actually someone else's dream that we are all part of, we are actors. So there's for the gentleman at the back. <laughs> I think I think life is very real. Yes. But however, we 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 are always acting. We act out how we interpret life, how we want people to understand us, how we want people to view us, everything. But I believe life is very real. But the way that we interact uh, day to day, that's when we act. But life is very real to me. I'm looking at the play. Um, uh, I don't know about you guys. Um, is there any other aspects, you know, that resonated that you can, you know, relate to, you know, to everyday life, you know, to the things that were happening within the play itself? Yeah. Yeah. Um, anybody? Like, for example, okay, I'll start. Um, for example, like the king, you know, he he had this battle between um, uh, maintaining his, his status and also protecting it, and also there's the family side. And he was caught in between whether to make a decision that's going to that's going to you know save his reputation and also on the parent side he was you know it, it was suffering you know and um, we also see that in our day-to-day -day life that um, you know maybe in order to 
save our reputation within the community or it, at work. You know, we have to make these decisions, which in turn also affects the family as well. Uh, okay, I don't know about you guys. Yes, Sandra. Um, I'm thinking, when I look at the king and the players of whole, I'm thinking how easy it is for us to criticize you know, the one in power, the king who's in power. And I'm thinking if it was me in that place. Ah. <laughs> but you've done the same thing though. So many, it's, it's so many difficult decisions. Yeah. You listen to the it's stars though. But he's a man of God, but listen to the stars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, with what you're saying and hers as well, it kind of aligns because I'd be thinking we face the same choices each and every day or at some point in our lives, but not exactly the same. With the king, it was his son and him having read the stars and people saying he would destroy uh, the country. In our lives, it's usually a little different. It's, it's something we want to do. It's our passion. It's a career choice. And then it's everyone telling you, hey, you want to go do music? You won't make it in life. Mm -hmm. And at every point, we start, we start killing off or trying to protect ourselves from it. And then maybe later on in your life, 10 years of accounting later, you decide, you know what? I really wanted to do music. Mm -hmm. But when you now try to <coughs> fix everything and connect the dots, it's, it is lousy, like how the king now tried to fix it. Not everyone gets to fix it okay, because all the years that you wasted in between, what would have actually made a difference. Yeah, anybody else from that side, please? <laughs> <laughs> Before I start calling names. Yes, gentlemen, thank you. Um, from the play, I kind of got um, how to let go and probably accept a new moment mm -hmm. for what it is. Yes. A happy moment for what it is. Mm -hmm. Not try to let past pain define you or try to cage yourself like now nah, we're not going I'm not gonna open up because it might just all crumble. Just learning to accept the colours of life as they just flow through. Yeah. Um, anybody else? Yes. Yes. Um what, what I found really <coughs> Uh, interesting about this play is is one of the strongest themes which is fate versus free will because uh, Segismundo's fate was set for him that he's going to be a tyrant he's going to be this but he was never really given a chance to to fight fate and you know there's there's many types of people in this world um, and many religions where where there's there's no um, how do I say this where there's not a lot of emphasis on our ability to choose, uh, to to choose wh wh where our destiny will end will end up. You know, um, God gives us free will, and that for me that was a very exciting thing, turning point for Segis Mundo when he when he he could have come out and killed everybody from the beginning to the end. I mean, he pulled out this guy's eyes, the servant's eyes, but eventually he found um, the goodness within him. And another theme of the play is, is man inherently good or evil? And despite the injustices thrown at Segismundo, he came out better than his dad, and he forgave everybody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something that I actually wanted to say. Um, like, <clears throat> one thing I noticed in the play was that battles, the biggest battle is not against the outside, it's mm -hmm. against yourself. Mm -hmm. Because when Segismundo overcame the animal and the man that was within him, he was really able to find who he is. Mm -hmm. And I think most often we get lost trying to find people instead of actually finding ourselves. Because once we overcome who we are, yeah. we can be able to overcome the extent. Just kidding. I guess uh, what I mostly got out of it um, was the, the aspect of uncertainty. You know, the, just the fact that you do not know where life is going to end, you know. and. The decisions that the king, the decision that the king made to chain up Segismundo, I would say it was justified, right? Because one of the biggest problems, maybe it's not a problem, but one of the biggest things with life is that we do not know where we are going to be in the next 10 years. So because we do not know, we try and fix everything today, right? Because you know there's the signs, exactly what he was saying that, you know, you're not going to be a musician. I'll tell my son, you're not going to be a musician because 
you're going to be a pauper if you choose to be a musician. You know, I'm trying to protect him. You know, the same thing with Basilio. He's <coughs> trying to protect the kingdom. So I just think that's one of the major things that I got that, you know, you can't deal with tomorrow today. You know, it's, it's I don't know, that's debatable, but that's just the, the whole thought that I got. Mm. Great, yeah, yes. Uh, I, I like what he's saying. And I think the other aspect is, um, there is the control factor, but what you can't con um, there's certain things like the, just the moral choices that you make are the things that are within our control as, as individuals. And as much as the thing of what, about what Basilio is trying to control, um, to some extent it was still going to be out of his control because you can't control the way someone's going to turn out and the decisions that they're going to make. It's just about us trying to learn from those decisions and to try to make better decisions. Like what Sejus Mundum actually managed to do afterwards, he learned from his mistakes and then made better choices. And he's fortunate in that he could actually change everything. But sometimes we continuously make the wrong kinds of decisions. And in that sense, life is not a dream because you'll end up living a living nightmare because of the bad decisions that you make. So you have to, you can't just say, ah, oh, well, <laughs> like there's some things that you can't say, ah, oh, well, that happened yesterday, let me forget about it. Like if you're consistently behaving in a way that destroys relationships, in a way that burns bridges, you can't dream that away. That's that's real life and you're going to have to live with the consequences of that. And that's also what the king had to live with in his in his son's anger. He couldn't, like I think Sergius Mundo was, was right in saying, you know what, you can't sit and come and say, oh, I'm going to deny you a hug. When he's like, I'm 25, dad. He's been denying me hugs for like 25 years. It's not going to make a difference now. You can't undo the past, but you can try to make better decisions.